morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this panel dedicated to uh, human rights, 30 years of Czech human rights policy abroad, achievements and new challenges. We have a very distinguished panel with us. Let me very briefly introduce uh, those who are joining me. But let me start with uh, Arsu Gebulaeva, a prominent analyst, journalist, blogger, and trainer from Azerbaijan. On my left-hand side, Manuel Cuesta Morua. Manuel is uh, a Cuban activist. His track has been uh, stretching for a number of decades. And uh, uh, he is one of the drivers, the engines of the discussion on human rights in Cuba and outside of Cuba. On my right hand, right hand side, Karl Gershman, a long time president of the National Endowment for Democracy, and opposite to me, uh, Sasha Vondra, uh, who I don't think needs a special introduction in, in Prague, uh, his uh, dissident and official uh, roles played in this country and one of the architects of uh, Czech or Czechoslovak uh, in the past uh, human rights uh, policy. Uh, welcome all. Uh, I'm Martin Poveshil. I'm the Deputy Foreign Minister uh, and I have to uh, ask for your understanding for the absence of Minister Petřiček who should have been uh, in this uh, chair but uh, due to the uh, crisis uh, in Turkey or Syria uh, he uh, had to travel to Luxembourg to take part in the uh, foreign ministers meeting of the uh, European uh, Union. Uh, I will try to drive the discussion first uh, among and between the participants in the panel and then open it to, uh, to the public. There will be a microphone uh, circulating, but better to say thrown to you, uh, by, the, uh, by the staff of uh, Forum 2000, so don't be surprised if you uh, ask for the floor that you will get a, uh, uh, a, a, a cube uh, thrown to you. Uh, there is a microphone in it and feel free to, uh, to speak. So, where are we? 30 years, uh, 30 years since the Velvet Re Revolution in, Czech uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, when we started uh, designing the Czech foreign policy, uh, human rights inevitably and logically was one of the building blocks upon which we, uh, we built it. And uh, we felt that paying attention to human rights uh, was one of the uh, natural obligations that this country in those changes and after them uh, had, to, uh, had to play. Uh, and we did that throughout the transition here in Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic and started projecting our human rights policy uh, abroad. Uh, why, would the, why would we do that? We understood that without the support to human rights in communist Czechoslovakia or in the communist bloc uh, as a whole, uh, our trans transition would have been much more difficult and much more uh, clumsy. Uh, in that, we could rely on uh, Western support. That support was moral above all, but also political and practical and, of course, uh, financial. So we have felt ever since that one of our duties uh, that we have to uh, fulfill uh, was do our utmost and the best to repay that uh, debt, to carry on that legacy, uh, mainly vis-a-vis -vis our Eastern and Balkan 
partners. Uh, you probably know that we have done quite a bit. We have been uh, attributing to uh, human rights and transitional promotion uh, some uh, quite considerable financial uh, resources. Uh, we provide visa assistance. We take up an, an active role uh, also uh, on multilateral fora, fora beyond uh, raising the human rights issues uh, bilaterally. So uh, the first quite natural question uh, would uh, be to you colleagues, uh, how do you see uh, the role of Czech Rep Republic in the area of human rights promotion, human rights policy uh, from your different uh, perspective? Uh, have we been doing enough? Uh, how does the, the needs of those who receive our support change? What other tools should we uh, employ? Arsu, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I would like to focus on the shift in the needs um, of the civil society that's been on the receiving end of support. Um, and the reason why I'm focusing on this is because while the legacy has been really important in building the knowledge, um, I think at this current stage, especially in countries like Azerbaijan, um, things look very different than they were. And um, the needs have changed. And I would like to hear focus on um, the legal changes, for instance, that have been introduced um, in Azerbaijan that have made it extremely difficult for civil societies to operate. And these changes have been happening in the last few years. Or the authoritarian technology that's been uh, purchased by the authorities to um, use surveillance um, in various ways against the civil society um, actors. And I would also like to focus on the way certain countries turned out. Um, you know, it wasn't always sort of um, part of, uh, like it wasn't always expected that all of these countries are going to turn out to be, um, you know, functioning democracies. And I think Azerbaijan is just one of those examples where we've not seen um, any shift in that matter. And there are some, some glimpses of hope every now and then, but I think um, in this particular country and within the context of um, support that's, com that's been coming, I think it's really important to highlight how the needs have changed and the circumstances have changed. And one of the most important um, ways to move forward is actually to take into account these changes and understand that um, previous mechanisms of support uh, do not work in context when, for instance, you can no longer receive funding from a certain country in order to be able to operate, or when your partners on the ground are no longer able to operate because they're in jail, uh, or because of certain other um, limitations. Um, so I would like to end it here, but I think this is the key in looking forward, in actually um, changing the perspectives on, on assistance and taking into account the different threat models that's been in place and actually focus on these threat models while we move forward, um, you know, coming up with new scenarios, taking into account that the way that the regimes worked um, 15 years ago is no longer the case because they're using different kinds of methods in, in either silencing their critics or um, going after the human rights defenders. Thank you. Thank you. Carl, uh, what's your take on that, you know, the change of the world, you know, to, well, let's say politely to more pragmatic, uh, realpolitik, uh, like uh, situation that we, that we have been living now? You know, the Czech Republic represents something very special in the world um, because it has, look, it has upheld these values. And there's been a struggle here because, you know, five years ago, I, I remember that we weren't sure whether the Czech Republic was going to stay the course. But you have. And I want to commend the foreign minister, you, and the, you know, the government and the people for staying the course on these issues. Um, and, and it's not just in the region. I mean, I think you said that the Czech Republic was very helpful in different ways in the region, but it is truly been for a small country, a global 
a global policy. I mean, Havel was the person who really was responsible in 1990 when he could have gotten the Nobel Prize for really urging the Nobel Committee to give the prize to Aung San Suu Kyi. She's been a disappointment, I know that, but uh, at that time it was an, ex you know, an extraordinary step of solidarity. And then, you know, Cuba, far from the region, there is no country in the world that has done more to help the struggle in Cuba. We just had on the previous panel Rosa Maria Paya. I don't know if she's still with us. Where is she? Right there. Ah, hi. <laughs> I mean, it should be noted that Havel and Rosa Maria's father, Osvaldo Paya, had a very close relationship. And it was really, Havel was advising Paya to prepare for the change. Uh, and they, they collaborated closely together. And I think it cannot be emphasized strongly enough that they murdered her father in 2012. They murdered him, July 22nd, 2012. And it would have been like the communist government murdering Havel. Imagine if that had happened here, if the communist government had murdered Havel. And Havel knew that he had to show solidarity with Cuba afterwards, and so he stayed. In 2004, I think it was, we, had, we supported a big international conference here in Prague <coughs> on North Korea. Again, and then Havel wrote about North Korea. And the Czech Republic has stayed the course on North Korea. On China, uh, Liu Xiaobo saw himself as acting in the tradition of Havel. The Dalai Lama from Tibet was the first foreign leader to come to the Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution. I mean, once you think about the global role that is being played by this small country, and I might have some you know, comments to make about this in the course of the discussion. I won't go into it now. But in 2017, when this crisis that we're talking about became a matter of urgency for the international community, working with Forum 2000, which was Havel's organization, he created it, together we convened a meeting here in Prague in May of 2017 and we drafted the Prague Appeal for Democratic Renewal. It's significant that it's the Prague Appeal for Democratic Renewal, which was a global statement. Uh, Maya Sandu was one of the initial signers, but people all around the world have signed this. And it's a declaration, not only of solidarity, but how can we move forward in addressing the new challenges that we face? Maybe we'll get onto that. I won't talk about that now, but we did it here in Prague because Prague is a global center for the defense of freedom and democracy in the world today. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Manuel, Cuba has been on our minds ever since the very changes here in, uh, in Czechoslovakia at the turn of the 1980s and 1990s. At that time, we naively thought, you know, that the, the days of the Cuban Castro regime were counted. Uh, we tried to do our best to help it, and we failed so far. So what's your perspective? Yeah, everybody fails. I'm trying to uh, convince Castro of the need of open society and to grant people their human rights and so on. So the change had to come in Czechoslovakia at the time, Czechs, after for uh, Cuban uh, have possibility to open to the idea of fighting for human rights. And I would like to, 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 to stress uh, this uh, difference uh, out of the collapse of the communist uh, war. Czechs makes the important difference in the case of Cuba because we can understand the collapse of the communist war in geopolitical terms. But if we want to understand the values of 
fighting for democracy, we should uh, use the idea of human rights. And that's the way Czech Republic made a difference. Hmm. And sometimes, at that time, we're talking about uh, mainly 1993, 1994, it seems that the diplomatic relations between Czechs and Cuba was between the Czech government and the dictative movement in Cuba at that time. And that stressed the importance of the human rights of uh, foreign policies uh, toward uh, democratic needed all over the world, mainly in the case of Cuba. And we consider three uh, points, and we want to point it out, three ideas, it's very important to keep in mind uh, for improving, if you want, their relation and their support to the human rights uh, fighting. First, have a touch, uh, one important point, when he put human rights over politics, and this is very important. Secondly, Czech Republic become um, turn human rights into foreign policies, and this is very important because <laughs> if we see uh, the delay of the Cuban transition, it is frustrating not uh, to see the possibility of having free elections, free institutions, and the human rights respect. But the sole support we have in the Western Hemisphere, clear, crystal clear support, uh, comes uh, from Czech Republic, and this is due to the human rights uh, values inserted in the foreign police you have uh, developed uh, since uh, uh, 19 or since the Belbert Revolution. Thank That's you very much. Pleasure. Sasha, you are among us the one, you know, who has been with uh, the Czechoslovak and Czech uh, human rights policy from the very beginning, from the turn, uh, from the Velvet Revolution. Uh, give us a, your assessment where, where we stand today. Uh, we, within uh, the Czech Foreign Service, we, we try to do our best to keep human rights, you know, uh, high on top of our agenda. Uh, it's thanks to Minister Petřiček that we have managed to return them more, much more into the focus of what we've been doing. But uh, uh, what is your X-ray? Well, uh, Martin, I was lucky that I could uh, be at the building of the Czech foreign policy uh, 30 years ago, uh, when we have uh, made the human rights case and the freedom in general as one of the key pillars of our uh, foreign policy activities, and were concentrated and energetic enough that uh, we could, were able even to generate the substantial results. Havel has uh, opened, uh, as the first uh, president, the red carpet for Vitauta Landsbergis to support uh, the collective uh, rights of Lithuania with the split of the Soviet Union. Havel was the one who invited uh, Dalai Lama as the first president uh, to upheld uh, the individual uh, human rights of uh, the Tibetan people. Uh, uh, we, Havel was the man who, uh, who brought two freedom fighters into the pedestal of uh, Nobel uh, Peace Awards, one from Burma, the other from China. Uh, Havel was uh, the man who uh, initiated the, uh, the support of the freedom fighters in Cuba. I remember Havel was also supporting Issa Gambar when he was trying to, uh, to defeat uh, <laughs> Ilham Aliyev. Uh, that's 15, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, 
I think uh, one has to admit that uh, the Czech Republic has changed since that. But to blame the, just the Czech Republic, uh, I guess, would not be uh, entirely fair because the world has changed too, unfortunately, I think, for all of us. 30 years ago, uh, we were lucky in uh, having three important things. First, here in Central and Eastern Europe, we had a generation of the new political leaders who had a personal story fighting for the freedom and democracy. So for them, it was not just an abstract concept, it was the way of life. life. It was something what, you know, they felt as the real value, not just an abstract one. Secondly, uh, in the West, the leaders were at least enough sensitive to, uh, to that, uh, that they were able to provide uh, the support. It was a, this optimist time of Fukuyama thinking. And that brings me to the third element that those who, took the, who climbed to the power like Havel and others in the region, they had the feeling that they have to somehow reciprocate uh, for the support they enjoyed. You know, Karl Gashman was among uh, those who uh, within the uh, National Endowment for Democracy provided the concrete support, for example, to the Polish solidarity in 1980. So uh, we had some ethics that, you know, now when he won, we need somehow to return that. So it was a kind of a transactional concept of the world, but uh, in a value-based. Uh, now it's entirely different because this generation is gone. Uh, Czech Republic, you know, is led by uh, the president and the prime minister for they are totally ignorant of that concept because they did not have any kind of a personal story uh, associated with that. The world, uh, and I would say the Western world, has changed too. Uh, 30 years ago, it was about the elementary concept of basic freedoms and human rights. Now, you have split it, that uh, uh, effort into two very different camps, and both, are, I think, are doing wrong in that. One is this purely real politic or transactional uh, concept, but not as a, not as a value based, but, but a, a business one. Donald Trump is embodiment of that. But Erdogan and others, you can take others there. On the other hand, there are still those, for example, in Scandinavia, who are trying you know, to promote the human rights. But what they did, that they extended the concept of the human rights uh, into such, you know, culture and social uh, corners uh, that they cease to be attractive uh, universally for the majority of the people around the world. Maybe you like it, but, you know, if we would make an investigation about how many Azeris uh, are seeking uh, all those, uh, you know, uh, rights of the third, fourth, or fifth generation, you know, it's, that's why Issa was losing. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, to re-energize ourselves, we need to, to change a little bit ourselves too. Uh, to focus on uh, the real elementary freedoms and human rights because they have the universal nature and without any doubts almost every single state has the obligation to, uh, to follow them. Uh, secondly, we should focus on a uh, few countries where is a chance to success because we terribly need a success story. Yeah. What has changed also that 30 years ago we had the success stories. Now, you know, just tell me about one in the last 
five, seven years. It's, it's really difficult to, mm. to find. So we need also a success story to re-energize re ourselves. So just to blame the Czech Republic, I think, is not enough. Although, you know, both president and the prime minister is a shame from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carl, you are, I think, the most experienced from, from a, among us, as you reminded us in the, in the backstage. Uh, and we, all of us, agree that the world has changed since the 1990s, 1980s. You know, uh, uh, the, the value-based approaches have, uh, I would say, blurred into transactional approaches in, in politics and policies. And as Sasha points out, uh, we have difficulty in defining one visible, symbolic uh, success uh, in the period of last uh, five to ten, ten years. Uh, also, the, the overall environment has changed with the digitalization. You know, the world is a different place to, to live than it was 30 years back, you know, when we had to uh, camouflage, uh, but physically camouflage how we pass messages among and between, between ourselves today. The, 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 you know, the means are completely, completely different. Uh, should these fundamental changes uh, bring us to a fundamental change of how we pursue uh, human rights policies uh, around the globe? Uh, what is it we should, we should do? What is it the, the NAT wants to do uh, to face <coughs> these, uh, these changes? Well, one point that uh, Sasha just made, I think he said we need some success stories, and I think that means the transitions that are underway. We're living, you know, as bad as certain things are today, let's remember that there are a number of countries that were once dictatorships, Moldova being one of them, but not the only one, that are now going through what I consider to be historic transitions, and that includes, you know, Ethiopia, it includes uh, Sudan, it includes Tunisia, Armenia, Ukraine, um, and uh, many, many countries are going through this, Malaysia included, and there is no better way to respond to, in a way, the Chinese alternative, the alternative option, as Xi Jinping said in two sets, 2017 at the 19th Party Congress, the option of developmental authoritarianism, than to have these transitions succeed. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that, and this was a point that was really highlighted in the uh, Prague Appeal, uh, you know, in this period when these issues have become human rights so diluted, I think is what Sasha is saying, uh, and the, the term human rights is even changing because it sort of encompasses everything. You have to return to fundamentals. There has to be a reaffirmation of the basic freedoms uh, of, of expression, of human dignity, um, of freedom of association, uh, free media, and so forth. These basic freedoms, there has to be a reaffirmation of that and why they're important. Um, and on the basis of that, we can go forward. I might say there's one other issue that should be given a lot of serious consideration as to how to rebuild a kind of a democratic center in the world when the world is so polarized between a kind of populist and authoritarian right and then uh, even a populist uh, left today that has lost the connection with these basic values. And we put this into the Prague Appeal, but it's something that should, you know, be seriously considered. And it has to do with the issue of national identity. Uh, and, you know, when you countries join the European community, um, there are, you know, you, and, and the process of globalization, there is a tendency for people to lose a sense of what makes them a people, a, a national entity. Uh, and you've got to revive that. I mean, you know, there is a feeling some, on the globalized left that somehow sovereignty is a bad thing, that the nation state is out of date and we have to get beyond the nation state in a globalized world. That's wrong. And I don't think we're going to reestablish 
a meaningful political center, revive a meaningful political center and revive democracy until we can bring the values of freedom, democracy, the liberal values of democracy together uh, with, the, with the idea of national identity. Uh, we've got to fight for that. Uh, it's going to be a difficult thing, but we have to think how that can be done and to defend the rights of the nation state while also maintaining a commitment to universal freedom. It's a difficult balance to maintain, but I think rebuilding the political center in the world today, and this is everywhere, it's everywhere, uh, is going to require that. Thank you, thank you. Arzu, you have been one of those who have been particularly active on the new media, in the new media area. Uh, you've been trying, you know, to make full use of, uh, of that to promote um, exactly what Carl uh, has been describing. Uh, so what is it, you know, that we could, we could do more effectively and efficiently uh, to make it work even better? That's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> I know. That's why I'm asking you. Oh, well. uh, I'm afraid I don't have a clear answer to that because I think we shouldn't really see or treat new media and new media platforms as this solution and, and something that will resolve all of our issues in this day and age. I mean, obviously, it's a tool um, in making progress um, in perhaps um, getting some of those success stories out, but it's definitely not the main. It's, it's, part, it's a component of, of a bigger and much larger process. Um, I think... Obviously, what I've seen personally is this growth in the presence of online media. Uh, and it's not because technology is great, but many, one of the main reasons why it's happening is because in countries like Azerbaijan or Turkey, online media and these new platforms are the platforms for discussion. This is the place where uh, you have more freedom to um, not just share opinions, but also navigate opinions and also harness support of, of the public. And I think this is really important to consider that this new media uh, works in these particular environments in a very different way than it would, for instance, in another country where democracy is thriving or the political situation is different. I think that's one um, element to mention. I think the second, just literacy overall, new media literacy, but also literacy in general. I mean, we were talking about success stories, we're talking about this democratic culture. I think in countries where you haven't really had the culture of democracy, where, where the generations haven't really experienced the culture of democracy, it's really hard to talk about um, all these nuances because democracy for an opposition in country A might mean something different than democracy for an opposition in country B. Um, and I'm certainly witnessing this in countries like Turkey. I live in Turkey. I've seen how this country has transitioned over the, over the recent years. I'm seeing this in Azerbaijan and other neighboring countries. Um, so this readiness and again, like the literacy about these, these norms is really important to, to consider and how they see new media. Um, is it a place where you just go and, and express yourself or is this a place that you use as a campaign platform where you can actually share opinions? Uh, but one um, last thing I would like to mention, especially uh, highlighting the significance, how these small new voices are emerging um, using new media platforms to shed light on some of the issues going on. And um, I would just give one uh, small example. Uh, recently there was this rally in Baku, an opposition rally, and there was this man who was um, yelling um, and, and shouting in support of the current president, and he was expressing his gratitude to the president for the things that he has done. And right next to him there was this woman um, who was basically counter-arguing everything he was saying, and she was, she was, she was listing all the issues. She was talking about um, social welfare, she was talking about the salaries, she was talking about the pensions, and she became the symbol of this protest, which was really interesting, because um, later on, one of the outlets did an interview with her, and you know, she, they showed the, the conditions that she was living in, a very poor, um, struggling uh, with, with everything, literally. And, um, because this was shown using an online media tool, shared using new media platforms, uh, people came forward and offered support. Now, this is not a solution. You know, the, the, 
some, some businessmen shouldn't be providing support to a person um, and solving that problem because that problem is actually needs to be solved by the authorities. But it definitely teaches a lesson and sends a lesson to the authorities showing that these platforms are being used for, for calling for attention or these platforms are being used to share stories that authorities in certain countries may not want to see or they block out of their vision. Um, so for me, uh, as someone who, you know, I'm, a, I'm an online media journalist, I, I work for online platforms um, and it's, it's a place that I use to share my stories, also get information um, and indicate my support for, for issues. But when I look at the bigger picture, it's certainly not the only um, solution. It's just part of um, a bigger effort that needs to be made. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Manuel, how does it work in Cuba with the limited access to, uh, to internet, to the uh, globalized media? Uh, is there a piece that, that plays a role or is it negligible? When Carl talked about uh, the need of rescue fundamental rights, I invite everybody to look at Cuba. Because this is the place where, where everything is going to be decided in terms of fundamental rights in the Western Hemisphere. Now, you know, the, the Cuban government has made some reforms. Uh, the people people had more access to uh, internet. We have uh, no 5G, but we have 3G in our mobiles. And at the same time, we are witnessing a great development of the Cuban civil society. If we compare, if we talk about Cuba, you have to, to establish more or less three levels of understanding the situation. One level is the economy shortage we are, we are suffering right now. You know, we are in a cycle, running around in circle when it comes to the economy situation in the, the economy for a second. It is the uh, development of what I call the best civil society Cuba has ever had in this moment. In cultural terms, human rights groups, political expressions, and mainly, and more importantly, the media. Online, of course, media online. So we have these developments in Cuba right now. The third level is the political one. And there is a contradiction between society and the political system because of the behavior of the Cuban government against civil society. Right now, we are witnessing what I call the extrajudicial execution of civil society in Cuba. And it reflects these tensions uh, that are on the rise right now in, in Cuba, and it reflects how we are prepared to make the jump to the uh, democratic war. But we need the help, of course, of uh, Czech Republic, and we need the help of the Western democracies. One friend of mine used to ask in Cuba if uh, democracies are driven by democracy when it comes to uh, the support of the Cuban fighting for uh, having freedom or having free expression. And that's the thing, uh, that's the situation right now in my country that it's, it's a pleasure to be here to, to explain this and to uh, have a good conversation with the, all the colleagues here. In, in Thank Prague. you. Thank you. Sasha, one of the trends that we have been observing over, over time for maybe more than a decade now is the changing uh, atmosphere and correlation of powers and influence on international fora and the stress being put on, on individual rights on the one hand, that, mean, that means you know, going back or sticking to the fundamentals 
uh, on the one hand, and this is something you know that the Czech Republic has been over time vocal uh, about, and on the other hand, an increasing uh, drive towards uh, collective rights. Uh, that seems to gain ever more support internationally from a number of increasing number of countries and push the individual rights, you know, uh, sort of into the backstage. Uh, how to face this if we mean it uh, to go back to fundamentals and rebuild the political center as, as Carl suggests? Well, I think we have to be aware of one thing, that if the collective rights are at stake, it's always more difficult and more tough and more controversial uh, than if you promote just the classic individual natural uh, human rights and, and, and freedoms. Because they are, since 18th century, on those natural individual rights, we have a common sense that uh, they don't, depend on uh, the state power, they, they are natural. With the collective, it's always more difficult. Just take a right for the self-determination. I mentioned how we were supporting in 1990 the collective aspiration of the three Baltic states to re-establish uh, their statehood. How Havel has uh, uh, open the red carpet here for a uh, newly elected uh, Lithuanian president in a moment where they were not recognized yet. Uh, they have won, even without a war or without a major military uh, conflict. There were some bloodshed, in, for example, in Vilnius. But, uh, why they have succeeded, not just uh, only because of our support, not just only because of their strong uh, determination to do it, but also because Gorbachev has allowed it. They did not send the huge army, they just symbolically uh, put some uh, soldiers and and, and the tanks in front of the TV, but it was uh, quickly over. Um, so those collective rights, for example, in the case of the self-determination rights, they depend, they are not natural. They depend on the will of the others. Uh, we were invited for a panel to be chaired by uh, Foreign Minister Petricek. Uh, he's not here but uh, he's largely excused because, uh, is, as, as I understand, he flew into, into Brussels to discuss with the European foreign ministers uh, the development on, uh, on uh, the Turkish-Syrian borders uh, and in larger scale uh, the problem of, of, of the Kurds. And this is a you know, it's a very sad story. It's a, it's a disaster in, uh, from the perspective of the human rights. You know, just today morning, I, I have uh, uh, saw, you know, in, in Twitter, uh, how they stone uh, uh, the woman Kurdish uh, uh, politician. She was not a radical. She was, in fact, uh, a woman uh, to promote uh, an understanding among uh, among the peoples there, but, but she was brutally killed. And they even taped this uh, on, 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 on the video. Uh, so it's really a disaster. Uh, at the same time, we are in a trap because this sad nation, which, you know, one would can say that you know, small nations are always in a more difficult situation than the big ones, but you know, 30, 35 million people is not a small nation. It's, uh, it's much uh, bigger than the Czechs, Slovaks and others. But uh, they are in a situation that nobody in the region is supporting. Uh, 
their collective aspiration. Turkey does not support Syria, does not support Iran, does not support um, Iraq, does not support Saudis, uh, don't support. So even the powers of the world do not support this, at least in art. Neither Russia nor US. I would expect EU would uh, adopt some kind of a proclamation, but certainly does not have enough uh, uh, determination uh, to, to, to uphold their collective uh, aspiration. So uh, this is a tragedy, but that does not have an easy outcome. Uh, you know, it's not about our words. It's neither even not about the words of the politicians in, in Brussels, it's about the determination uh, to use the ports, to, 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 to have the troops there. And we have seen that, you know, the United States is the only country which was really willing to, <coughs> to do it in the last uh, century uh, is withdrawing. So that's just, uh, let's serve this one of the examples mm how to operate with the collective uh, rights is much more uh, challenging than with the classic uh, individual uh, rights which have uh, a natural... Thanks, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I would now like to open uh, the, the discussion to the, to the audience. Uh, I see one over there. Wow. Go, go ahead, if you can introduce yourself and... Uh... Sure. Uh, my name is Arsen Haraitz and I'm from Armenia. As we all know, we've just going through a velvet revolution of our own and we are currently facing great challenges after the revolution because we live in a neighborhood where democracy is not a very popular thing. Uh, Carl here, um, I'm a long-time NED grantee, among other things. And of course, I uh, want to thank everyone in the panel, my great friend Arzu, who uh, we've been dealing with our own region for a while. Now, I just want to bring up a couple of uh, points or questions here, which was mentioned, uh, and it is about the challenges of the democracy spoilers in the neighborhood. Um, Carl was talking about we need good models to base on, and Armenia was mentioned, and I think this is a moment for South Caucasus or the larger region as a whole to make Armenian case as a great success of another Velvet Revolution. Uh, we may discuss what, when, and how. This was a long process that we were coming to, and it took us 30 years after our own liberation from Soviet Union to come with terms with a new, renewed democracy process. And I think a lot of the people in the neighborhood, a lot of the, country, uh, the regimes in the neighborhood feel threatened from Armenia. There are more spoilers in the neighborhood than supporters. And it's a, it's a tightrope walk for the international community and the democracy-promoting countries here. So I just want to bring this up and say, how can we help countries like Armenia, which have done, which have, we call it the homegrown revolution, because in many ways it was by large an internal process. Nobody expected this. This was a big myth buster. People would say, oh, until there is Karabakh conflict resolution, we're not going to have a revolution or democracy. Until there is this, until the influence of bigger states, well, it seems like we can. And I think this is very important now to understand, and for us also, Armenians living there, how we should build relations with other democratic states, including that of Czech Republic, that has a great success and was a great inspiration. It is called Armenian Velvet Revolution, and the source was the Czechoslovak Revolution back in the day. So I want to put this on the ground and maybe ask the panelists to touch upon on how we can walk this thin ice and then uh, thank you. Our way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take one more uh, in one go. Over there, the lady in the first row. Thank you. After Armenia, Azerbaijan. That's good. You know, <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> yeah. Leila <laughs> Yunus, human rights defenders. It's a question and suggestion. You know about Cuba, about Northern Korea, everything is clear, as it was clear with USSR and communist regime. But what about such small countries as, for example, Azerbaijan? It is a member of Council of Europe. It's a member of 
Eastern partnership with EU, but it's bloody dictatorship. And today's situation is much worse than it was in Soviet Union. 10 million population today, 127 political prisoners. In Russia, population 140, about 200 political prisoners. Each month, not year, each month, people in prison died after tortures. Also, 15 years boys. And Council of Europe keeps silent. They take money. And Mr. Vondra, our dictator is very welcome in Brussels. He is preparing the new agreement with Eastern Partnership. Of course, European Parliament has wonderful resolution. For example, in 2014, when we stay in prison. But, in general, keep silent. So I think that Czech Republic, who is a member of Council of Europe and European Union, can be together with such countries which deputies did not take money, as Netherlands, uh, and can appeal for sanction against bloody dictatorship, can stop authoritarian dictatorship. Azerbaijan can be in new Syria. We Thank have also Syria, Sunni, and problem with Armenia. Thanks. Thank you. It's Thank necessary you. to give more attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we have two uh, contributions. Uh, Carl, what would be well, yours? You planned it well. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Because, you know, in having Armenia and Azerbaijan, you raise the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's important to resolve that um, in order to have real progress in Armenia and in Azerbaijan. I mean, this is going to be a great challenge. You know, uh, Sam Huntington, when he wrote the book, The Third Wave, he talked about the issue of contagion democratic contagion. In other words, if it starts spreading, it develops a momentum. And look, as difficult as everything is today, I think we should recognize that there is a certain momentum that is beginning to develop in the Caucasus and with Ukraine. I mean, right now, Ukraine is making extraordinary progress. I mean, this is Putin's worst nightmare the fact that Ukraine is becoming, despite everything he's doing to frustrate this, a successful democracy. And Georgia, and now Armenia. This is something we have to think about and how to encourage. And so there's this issue of contagion, and then there's another issue which I think was sort of raised when you were getting into this issue of what, you didn't really define what you meant by collective rights, but when Sasha talked about it. It had something to do with minorities and self-determination mm -hmm. and so forth. But Sasha also talked about what's happening in Turkey today, in northern Syria. And that gets into the whole fundamental issue for, that is not often addressed by human rights activists and defenders, but it's the issue of what I would call geopolitical stability my country, my country, and falling down on the job of leadership. And it didn't just begin with this administration, as you, Sasha, probably know better than anyone. This is a, we have to somehow come to an understanding of what our role is gonna be. And then Europe has to do this as well. But how in this world do you preserve geopolitical stability? Because in the absence of geopolitical stability, you're not really gonna have progress in smaller countries. Our work, in other words, the work of democracy support and the work of human rights requires and is enormously assisted by a stable geopolitical environment. We've got to do that. And maybe one, one last point. I, I raised before the issue of national identity and sovereign rights. Everything has to be kept in balance. And I think we have to sort of see sovereignty as also in, in balance, and the way to balance it with individual rights is through democracy. You can have democratic sovereignty which respects individual rights. 
And we have to find the proper balance there. We can't go to one extreme which says that there's no need any longer for national borders, for sovereignty, uh, which is a terrible mistake on the left, but then you have a terrible mistake on the right, which is there's no need for individual rights, we just have sovereignty. We have to find the proper balance. So these issues of democratic contagion, of geopolitical stability, and the proper kind of balance uh, between sovereignty and individual rights and other issues, I think are going to be critical to our, uh, by our I mean our community's development of a coherent response to the current crisis of democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Arzu, do you want to make any comments on the regional? Um, yeah. We got two comments from the region. Absolutely. You are part of the region, so it would be appropriate <laughs> for you to say a few words, just a few. Time is pressing, so I don't um, insist, but... I would like to talk about the momentum, um, and I would like to talk about uh, how we should not mistake the momentum. Uh, because we had a momentum in 2003, for instance, when President Hamaliyev was elected. There was this expectation in, in Europe and elsewhere that this is a young leader. Um, he's interested in a close relationship with the EU and things might look different. But that changed as soon as the revenue started coming in from the energy, right? So his shift in the approach completely changed. And I think that was the first, one of the first mistakes of misjudging the momentum that this new leader came to power, replacing the old guard, and maybe things will change. Um, further, in a couple years later, there were certain events in Azerbaijan that were regarded as momentums that of possible change. Uh, when the authorities released 50 or so political prisoners, that was also a momentum. And, you know, there was this rush to congratulate the president and the government for releasing these prisoners. But no one said these people should not have been in prison in the first place. You know, none of those human rights defenders um, or political activists or journalists should have spent a day in jail. Um, so, while we talk about the momentum, while we talk about this um, contagious, I think we really need to not mistake it anymore. Um, and this is, you know, going back to what I said in, in, in the opening remarks, is that, you know, there is definitely a change in the needs. There's definitely a change in the circumstances. And Azerbaijan is just one of those examples. And Turkey probably is another example, especially given what's happening in, in, in the country at the moment. Um, so yes, let's be, let's, let's be, um, Let's take this into account that, that mm. the momentum is not always the right one or that, that let's not interpret it always the, the way that it might lead to something positive. But let's consider the bad scenarios as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm being reminded that uh, the time is up. Uh, but let me just in a few sentences conclude. I think that we, we all agree, you know, that the, that the environment has been changing dramatically over the past uh, uh, decades. The situation today is different than in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but, and I would now interpret or quote what Carl has said, uh, we, we do consider it uh, crucial and important to uh, stick to fundamentals and to rebuild momentum uh, around the uh, fundamentals. Always in close cooperation between administrations, NGOs, international partners, both bilaterally and in the international, uh, in the international fora. We certainly need to include new approaches and new uh, processes uh, in order to uh, respond to the uh, drive towards globalization and digitalization uh, of, the, of the world and use all these mechanisms uh, to support uh, public opinions and, and I would underline that, uh, the building of democratic institutions uh, because only democratic institutions can guarantee that democracy uh, can and will uh, prevail. With that, uh, I make my full stop. I uh, would ask you, uh, everybody, to give a big hand to our panelists and thank you uh, for being with us.